Welcome to another episode of Your Life Simplified. My name is Scott Sturgeon. Again, I'll be your host today. And today we've got a really interesting guest. I think it's going to make for a really exciting conversation. We have Leah Plunkett. She's the Associate Dean for Administration and Director of Academic Success at the University of New Hampshire School of Law. She's also an Associate Professor of Legal Stu- Legal Skills, excuse me, there as well. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School as well. And maybe most interestingly, and I think really relevant to our conversation today, Leah is the author of Sharenthood, which explores how the laws in the United States have influenced the current environment of how our information about us is shared, and really specifically about our kids, how that's shared online. So, so with that in mind, Leah, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, the feeling is mutual. So, Leah, just to kind of get the things started and kind of lay a groundwork, could you kind of describe this concept of of sharenthood and and sharenting is also kind of the kind of the um, descriptor that gets thrown around a lot. Could you kind of for our listeners kind of describe what that that is specifically? Sharenting has a couple of different definitions. The one that most folks are familiar with that I see a lot in the New York Times parenting section, for instance, is that sharenting refers to what parents say about children on social media. My definition is broader than that. While I think that what parents say about social media is a big part of sharenting, I don't see it as the only part, Scott. Properly understood, I think sharenting is all of the ways that parents, but also grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, coaches, and other trusted adults engage in any digital activities with children's private information. So again, social media, central to that. But sharenting also consists of using a smart baby booty to monitor your child's sleep patterns, having a smart assistant in your home, using an ed tech app to teach reading in school. So sharenting is really a lot more ubiquitous than just social media by parents themselves. That's really interesting. I think the the social media, at least from my perspective, when we first got kind of had conversations around this topic, the social media aspect always jumped out to me. You know, I think you see pictures of parents posting about their kid's birthday or you know, on, on whatever social media platform, just kind of a day, maybe their kids, their child's doing something funny and they post that. Not, I don't really know if there's a lot of thought maybe that goes into what's the bigger ramifications of doing so. But interestingly, I like the concept that you bring up, the, the additional elements of there's all this data that's being collected from all these different sources. So if, if there's an in-home um, speaker device that your child is now talking to, um, you know, that data is being shared somewhere. So the question is where, and uh, and with who? And I think that's that's kind of the, at least from kind of what I can see is kind of the crux of a lot of your your research. Do you is there anything specifically about you know kind of your research and your findings that you that really jump out at you about kind of what what you know what the scale of this is, is currently or or anything kind of interesting about that? The scale of this is enormous, and what's so difficult as a researcher is we really can't completely quantify it at this point. Because when we engage in sharenting, we are typically doing so through products and services that have privacy policies and terms of use that are opaque to individual users. And researchers can certainly parse them, um, but can't do so for every product. And even when researchers do parse them, we know that there tend to be gaps in the legal terminology that are so big you could drive a truck through them. So in terms of your great framing, Scott, of, um, and a really big truck, not like a small little sure, pickup sure. truck. We're talking double um, wide here. But, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I live in New Hampshire, so it's, you know, we, this is a good metaphor for me. Um, <laughs> so, it, But in terms of some of the things that you know, really jump out at me, is that when you see privacy policies in terms of use that allow tech companies to share data to improve the user experience or for marketing purposes or with our third, you know, with third parties that support us, um, those are really, really big double wide loopholes that allow companies to transmit information to data brokers, to use information in predictive analytics, 
to put information into AI systems. So a couple of concrete examples. One is a, a great piece by the New York Times just this past fall that looked at, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, how photos of kids, including toddlers, posted on social media were powering bleeding edge surveillance technology that facial recognition software developers were scraping social media sites and taking images that parents had shared and using them to train facial recognition technology without any meaningful notification to parents or opportunity to opt in or out. And there was one state that had a law that made this problematic because it was biometric information. But in general, because parents had been clicking on that, I accept, you know, terms and conditions of service, the companies were acting as if they were pretty much covered. Another example that I think puts this into a little bit of perspective is a forecast by Barclays Bank that came out this fall, which said that by 2030, a parent parental sharenting could cost almost 670 million pounds in online fraud or identity theft for kids. Wow. And, you know, when parents, yeah, it's a lot of money. It is, yeah. And if you think about it, think about it from the perspective, heaven forbid, of a hacker and an identity thief. If you can get your hands on a full name, full place, full date of birth, home address, and you manage to get, you know, in, in the U.S., a social security number from one of the many data breaches that have happened that have put them online. Um, you know, it's it's really not that hard to put together a fraudulent credit application in a child's name, particularly because there are very few legitimate reasons that kids would have a credit profile attached to their name and social security number. Sure. So it's low hanging fruit for folks who want to take out money in their name. It's interesting. So, you know, I guess I think that the challenge sometimes I see is that maybe number one, people just aren't really aware of, you know, what the the bigger ramifications are. It seems so harmless, um, you know, posting this picture from my kid's first birthday who, you know, what's it's, I'd want to share it with my friends or my family or, or that sort of thing. And, and I think for people that, that maybe sometimes, you know, people are aware or even aware of maybe they're giving up some privacy rights in doing so. Um, but at the same time, they're not, you know, not really concerned with it in general. So I, I think a question that comes up in my mind is when you've talked to people, you know, just about this, whether it's kind of experts on the subject or even just kind of in conversations, you know, in, in your personal life or with friends or family or, or what have you, what do you see kind of people's opinions on this being? Do you feel like there's a strong sentiment for it or against it? Is it kind of ambivalence? Is there is there like a strong sentiment you can you can feel about this? I have gotten a range of responses, Scott, and I've been so lucky. I've had conversations about my book Sharon Hood everywhere from little tiny towns in New Hampshire where I've been a guest at the local library to the stage of Town Hall Seattle or Town Hall LA or as a guest on the BBC or Marketplace Tech. And there there's a real range of opinions. Um most people sort of on the just objective question of is sharing something that we should be thinking about, most people will say yes. They will mm -hmm. sometimes say, oh, I hadn't, I was just sort of seeing it as normal behavior, but now that you pointed out, yeah, that's like, that's a thing, <laughs> to use a technical right. term. Um, but then there is a real range of opinions. I have heard everything from everyone's doing it, so the horse has left the barn, to continue with a New Hampshire-type metaphor, or <laughs> holy moly, I am so uncomfortable now that I'm hearing this, what can I do to change it? I think as with so many of our individual behaviors, you know, in our homes, and our schools, and in other personal spaces, there's just such a range of what happens. Yeah. Oh, it's, I, I think I could see that for sure. And I think that's probably the, I think the most interesting part about, you know, your book and really the whole sharing hood and sharing message is at the end of the day, maybe you feel very strongly for it. Maybe you're very strongly against it, regardless of your opinion. You know, it seems to me that at least for the end consumer, utilizing these products or services or what have you, that really it's just about making an informed decision, you know, being aware of what, you know, what's occurring. And, and I think, you know, as you mentioned, people are surprised to hear it. So it's, um, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's interesting from that perspective, really, as you mentioned, it's, it's a, this is all is relatively recent phenomenon, right? I mean, 
social media hasn't even existed for longer than, I don't know, you know, Facebook started maybe in 2005 or six, you know, so, so all of it's relatively new, as you mentioned, kind of the legal structures around it are, are relatively, uh, you know, just beginning to form from your perspective, where do you see all of this going? Is it, is it a continual increase of, of kind of, you know, the technology in our lives continuing to collect information on us? Do you see kind of a wave against it? Is, is there kind of a sentiment you're, you kind of see occurring over time? I think that there is increasing interest in comprehensive federal digital data privacy protections, at least for kids. Now, I am not one to put any of my money <laughs> on Washington, D.C.'s ability to solve problems in our current era, but I, you do see bipartisan introduction of digital data privacy bills. And that's rare in this day and age mm -hmm. of such divided government. And so I think from folks on both sides of the aisle, from folks on, you know, at least in my my anecdata, I guess you can say of, you know, talking about this this book everywhere from California to northern New England, um, you know, people are paying a lot more attention. So I do anticipate, Scott, that within the next five, 10, 15 years, we'll see shifts. I think there will be shifts that may be somewhat similar to the shifts that go on in other public health related questions. So there was certainly a time not that long ago where, hey, maybe seatbelts actually aren't helpful and maybe cigarettes are OK. And, um, you know, then obviously there are major changes and they're, they're part legal or regulatory and they are part social norms and practices. Mm -hmm. So while I, I certainly don't expect digital innovation to slow down, nor as a researcher do I want it to, mm -hmm. I think digital innovation is, is healthy for our economy and for the world and ultimately good for the progress of humankind. But I would like to see, in addition to folks making better informed choices, I would like to see some sort of minimal guardrails placed around what decision makers, so companies themselves, but also schools, employers, and our government, what those folks can do with pieces of digital data that relate to children and teenagers' intimate experiences that are being shared by parents or other adults without really realizing they're doing it mm -hmm. and not really having a meaningful opportunity to opt out of downstream use. I'd like to make sure that if I put on a fertility tracking bracelet or if I post an adorable picture of my one-year-old or even of my 16-year-old, I think as a parent and certainly from the child's perspective, I think the child as their own person deserves some sort of assurance that information from that won't somehow be aggregated, analyzed, and acted upon to make predictions about who my child will be when they grow up. It's really interesting. It's it's so hard now to look into a crystal ball and say, oh, this is what it'll be like in 20 years. And and you bring up a great point. It's like, you. I mean, really, we at the end of the day, we really don't know what the outcome is going to be from the sharing, sharing of this information now that, you know, years from now, like you said, there could be data issues or, or on the flip side, I think conversely, it's, you know, maybe over time we're able to aggregate data to, you know, for better health outcomes or, um, you know, better education or, or something along those lines. So, um, you know, just playing devil's advocate, I, I guess I see both sides. Thanks again for downloading this episode of Your Life Simplified, which is produced by Mariner Wealth Advisors. And at Mariner Wealth Advisors, we're here to serve as your advocate. We help people chart a course to reach their personal and financial goals so that they can have greater peace of mind that may lead to a more fulfilling life. We do this by always putting our clients first. Because as fiduciaries, we're required to provide guidance that's in the best interest of clients, not in the best interest of a company or shareholders or anyone else. So as you listen to this podcast and have questions about maybe your own financial situation or would simply like a second opinion or even you have an idea for a future podcast, please go ahead and email us at podcast at marinerwealthadvisors.com. If you found the information on this podcast valuable, please go ahead and share it with a friend or family member that you think might benefit from this information. And please don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. Leah, you're a law professor, 
Uh, you're also a parent. And so I think just in, I'm really curious to get kind of your perspective on specifically for you, like what's the current state of sharenting look like? And then also, you know, from kind of a legal framework, what does that look like in terms of who owns the actual intellectual property of a child's image, um, you know, and that sort of thing? Sure. So you're absolutely right. I come at this work from the per perspective of a law professor and a parent myself. And I think it's important for us to differentiate a little bit between things that, you know, parents and grandparents and you know aunts and uncles, et cetera, do really just kind of in a personal capacity and those parents who may be trying to monetize their children's information. So sometimes those folks are called influencers. Sometimes, you know, like in my book, I call them commercial sharents. But the, the legal questions get a little bit trickier when you are talking about a parent who is making money from putting YouTube videos up or mm -hmm. posting pictures or, you know, producing products. We start to get into kind of complicated terrain about whether and how labor laws apply in those circumstances. Right. I think in most instances, our, our current labor laws aren't really written to cover that. Um, different question about whether they should be. Um, so I think in terms of thinking about now just kind of parents in the course of ordinary life, parents really do have, I sometimes call it, you know, super protection for the choices they make about their children's images and data and activities. And I call it super protection because grounded in our federal and our state constitutions are protected liberty interests in choosing whether and when to become a parent and then how you parent. Mm -hmm. So unless you're getting into the kind of commercial sharing space, kids are not really going to have any legal leg to stand on for trying to get their parents to, you know, pay them royalties or to not share it something. Um, and there is a caveat, Scott, because I'm a law professor, so I always have caveats that, one, our laws <laughs> could change. True. So it's entirely possible that um, there could be safeguards going forward. Two, I never underestimate what creative and courageous litigators can come up with <laughs> um, <laughs> if they have a specific case. But, but also, three, there are still some very outer limits. So while there is not any comprehensive federal law that aims to reach into the home and say to parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles, here's what you can do with sharenting and here's a royalty scheme you have to pay, certainly our criminal laws and other laws of general applicability are in effect. And so you can't, heaven forbid, abuse or neglect your child, take a video put it online and defend against a criminal action or mm -hmm. an abuse and neglect action by saying, oh, I was just sharenting. And I'm, I'm not making that up. There have been documented cases of that, such as the YouTube channel Daddy05 that was covered by the Washington Post a few years ago mm -hmm. in depth. But but short of that, you know, the landscape is really very open for parents. It's It, it kind of seems like the Wild West. It's like and I guess a lot of technology kind of falls under that umbrella and, and it's maybe it's it, in pros and cons for that, you know, obviously the ability to innovate, create new things, um, you know, outside the purview of kind of a regulatory structure can be really advantageous, uh, you know, for the industry in general. But at the same time, we get kind of this kind of these outcomes that were not really ever anticipated, I'm sure, by any technology platform and building out what they, you know, whether it's a video streaming service or what have you, that they would have kind of that kind of issue, you know, those issues arising when it first came out 10 or so years ago. So it's, it just speaks yeah, to, I, I don't think, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I did not mean to step on your toes. I was just going to say, you're absolutely right. I don't think YouTube thought when they got started, oh, you know, what's going to happen when a parent abuses or neglects their child and, and puts it online. Um, you know, but I do think that, um, especially the tech companies of more recent vintage, um, it should not come as a surprise that when you have open platforms um, for content that you're going to get some content that really shouldn't be there. But continue, Scott. Sorry, I did not mean to <laughs> cut you off. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's, it's a, t it's a tough nut to crack just because it's, it's, it's for them. I think you're, you probably are right. There is some, some credence to that, that, you know, at the end of the day, there likely are going to be some bad actors. It's, it's like any industry you, you know, once you open the door, there's going to be people potentially trying to take advantage of the system. But, um, 
But, you know, regardless, I, I think, you know, with all of that in mind, I, I want to kind of segue real quick and, and ask you kind of an interesting question. When we look across kind of the sharenting landscape, as we currently see it, maybe there, there are, you know, I think one of the pros that people find for doing so is that it's, you know, it gives them the ability to share, you know, relatively, like you mentioned, intimate moments about maybe their children it, with, with whether it's family members or friends or what have you. And, and maybe this is more specific to social media, but sharing with family or friends, um, you know, moments that, you know, 20 years ago, they would have had a Polaroid of it and showed them whenever they saw them, you know, in person. But, you know, maybe we live in a world a little bit where we're not as um, localized to our family as, as maybe we used to be. And so the ability to share information online um, can be sometimes advantageous from that perspective. Um, I guess one question I wanted to ask, do you find, you know, from from everyone you've talked to and all the research you've done, are there best practices for for sharing, you know, sharing children's information, um, you know, with 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 individuals that you specifically want to have that information online? Is is there kind of a, you know, different different routes you've seen or safeguards in place that can be advantageous to doing so? Absolutely, and I do agree. I think that we live in an increasingly global world where not only folks that we know already might be far away from us, but actually there could be folks out there in the world whom we don't know IRL in real life, as the, as the kids call it, um, but whom we have a lot in common with. So, if you know, if you have a child with a disability or chronic illness, for instance, you might find a lot of solace and also valuable information from connecting with a Facebook group, let's say, for mm -hmm. families in a similar situation. So I, I certainly see the upsides of sharing. And in terms of protective measures, I would advise a couple of things. First, never post pictures of kids of any age in any stage of undress, even if it's completely innocent and innocuous, you know, nice day at the beach or something like that. Mm -hmm. We are learning more and more about just how how deep and how disgusting, quite frankly, um, you know, the internet can, can be with folks who might be looking at those images or repurposing them for truly illicit and dangerous purposes. Mm -hmm. Next, I would say never put your child's full name, exact date of birth, or exact location online. Those pieces of information are very valuable to potential identity thieves. And you can stay connected with the people you love or the people you don't know yet but are looking to, uh, <laughs> to develop friendships with sure. by using a first name or, you know, putting a, um, you know, only shooting your child where the face isn't visible or putting a smiley face emoticon over, over your child's face. Mm -hmm. I would also strongly advise not using surveillance technologies on your child. So smartwatches that tell you where your child is, apps on a teenager's phone that tell you where they are. You know, I think there can sometimes be specific reasons to engage in that kind of monitoring. But in general, I'm suspicious of it because I think, one, it may cut against kids and teens having to develop sort of self-sufficiency and coping skills. Two, I think location information, as well as information about when a child is going out of bounds that you set for them, mm -hmm. those are actually can be very revealing pieces of data. And without an ironclad guarantee from a tech provider, this information is only staying between you, the parent, and us, the tech company. It's not going to a data broker. It's not going to be used for marketing. Well, then why let a potentially large series of unknown institutions know your child's movements or when those movements include things that you have not signed off on because you can geofence on these things and sign up for alerts that, um, that tell you when a child's gone out of bounds. So that's a, another recommendation. And last but certainly not least, Scott, I really advise folks to have conversations about sharing with the other adults in the lives of their children. One of the questions I've gotten the most, I even talked to the Wall Street Journal about it, is what do I do about my parents? So the grandparents or right. my in-laws or my nanny. And I would say with a nanny or another caregiver, I would put in a written contract what the parameters of sharing are. If you don't want your nanny putting pictures of your child on social media, you should talk about that up front and have a written commitment around that. 
I don't think you need to be so formal with, you know, grandparents or aunts and uncles. But I think being explicit about your expectations, um, it's not too late to have that conversation. And I think that can make a world of difference. It's really interesting. It's, um, I think for my, you know, I, I just try to think of my personal life and, in you know, how I would approach talking with my parents about that. And I, I think it's, I think candidly, it's a little, I think when I think about it, it's like, Oh, is that awkward? I don't know. But at the end of the day, it is, it's, it's probably just in my mind. Cause it's, it's something I've never done. And, and it's like, we talked about, this is a brand new, relatively brand new industry, brand new phenomenon. So kind of the social structures of how you approach it are going to seem maybe a little, I don't want to say off putting, but um, but challenging, I think, from from the get go, and so I, I think you bring up some some really outstanding and, and interesting points to consider for listeners, and 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 for me personally, things I, I had never even thought of. So um, <laughs> really helpful for that, for sure. Oh, good. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Anytime. Um, so, Leah, I one of the actually, I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask too. I think I had seen there are sites now outside of kind of the big. Um, you know, bigger tech companies or social media companies or that sort of thing that have kind of more private, private networks for sharing, whether it's photos or, or information about, about children. Is that about, you know, kids, whether it's with the grandparents or the aunts, aunts and uncles or that sort of thing. Is that something you recommend as well? Or, or is it kind of the same things apply whether or not it's on a large, you know, platform versus a smaller one? It is definitely more protective to be on a smaller platform, especially one that is being designed to be what I sometimes call parent proof or share proof. You know, it, it occurs to me regularly, Scott, that we see large platforms like, you know, YouTube, for instance, offering a YouTube kids version. And, you know, the more companies I think that innovate to offer parent versions of their products. So maybe it's a small subscription fee, but there is an easy to understand ironclad guarantee that the information is not being sent to a data broker or used for marketing purposes or anything that parents might want to not have happen. Right. I think there's there's potential there. So yes, I certainly think smaller is better. I think anytime you're seeing something that is curated to address these concerns, that's likely to be better. I have a few caveats, of course, because I'm a law professor. It's what I do. (laughs) Uh, My first caveat, (laughs) otherwise I'd be out of a job. Um, My first caveat is that anything that is digital can be screenshotted and reshared if you're talking about, you know, a text or a post or an email. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's less risk of something like that happening. So for instance, I am, you know, really don't put my kids on social media, but I have an ongoing text thread with two of my best friends from college that has a ton of pictures of my kids on it. That is still sharing things. It's lower risk. Uh, The risks are that they will, you know, take the picture and resend it. I have complete confidence they won't. The risk is that my phone could be hacked into. I think that's minimal, um, hopefully. Um, But anytime there's digital transmission, there still is some risk. And, um, and I I have no particular product or service in mind when I say this, but just to get a general law professor note, if you are looking at privacy policies and terms of use that have that double wide truck language in it, you know, we won't share your information unless it's with a third party who's providing a service for us or to do market research or to improve the user experience, um, you you still aren't going to know with 100% certainty what is happening to that information. Right. Yeah. Leah, thank you so much for sharing a lot of really good insights from you and and definitely appreciate that. Leah, thank you again so much for taking the time to to sit down with me. It's been really, really enlightening. Um, Really appreciated having you on the show. I've had a wonderful time talking with you and your listeners. Thank you again. Again, for our listeners, the book is Sharon Hood. If you're interested in picking up a copy um, by Amazon and, and any other you know reputable bookstores, I have to think would carry it. Again, thank you, oh, as always, for listening. If you have any suggestions or thoughts you'd like to provide us for the podcast, we really encourage interaction from you. We can be reached at podcast at marinerwealthadvisors.com. Thanks for listening. 
Advisors, or MWA, is an SEC-registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in the state of Kansas. Registration of an investment advisor does not imply a certain level of skill or training. MWA is in compliance with the current notice filing requirements imposed upon registered investment advisors by those states in which MWA maintains clients. MWA may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Any subsequent direct communication by MWA with a prospective client shall be conducted by a representative that is either registered or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from registration in the state where the prospective client resides. For additional information about MWA, including fees and services, please contact MWA or refer to the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Please read the disclosure statement carefully before you invest or send money.